Hello, everyone. My name is Betty Cruz, and I'm the president and CEO of the World Affairs Council of Pittsburgh. It's my honor and privilege to be with you today. When we started planning a conversation on Ukraine, we did not imagine we would be here talking about Russia's invasion and continued escalation. Our mission at the Council is to convene and connect people around global issues to build a thriving, competitive, and inclusive Pittsburgh. And our vision is for a globally minded and globally connected world that is equitable and just for all. I feel these words deeply when I say them, and I hope they resonate with you too. Before jumping into our program, we wanna acknowledge for all joining us from around the region and world that we are located in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, the unceded ancestral lands of many indigenous peoples, including the Seneca, Lenape, Osage, and Shawnee. Through this acknowledgement, we invite you to join us in paying respect to the elders, both past and present. Now we are honored to welcome Ambassador John Teft, who will provide insight into President Putin's decision to invade Ukraine and what this means for global governance and diplomacy going forward. Ambassador Teft will be in conversation with Mila Sanina, who we are grateful to partner with. Mila is an independent journalist, a writer and editor based in Pittsburgh. Until earlier this year, Mila served as the executive director of Public Source, a nonprofit newsroom delivering public service journalism in the Pittsburgh region. Under Mila's leadership, Public Source has been billed as one of the innovative independent newsrooms known for its deep local reporting. Before joining Public Source in 2016, Mila worked for five years at the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette, where her last position was as deputy managing editor. Prior to the Post-Gazette, Mila worked at the PBS NewsHour and CNN International. She started her reporting career in Central Asia. A native of Almaty, Kazakhstan, Mila holds a master's degree from the Graduate School of Public and International Affairs at the University of Pittsburgh and a bachelor's degree from the American University in Bulgaria. Most of Mila's family lives in Kazakhstan. Some are in Russia, and she has further family connections in Ukraine. It is now my pleasure to turn it over to Mila to lead today's program. Mila, take it away. Thank you, Betty. And many thanks to the World Affairs Council of Pittsburgh for hosting this important conversation about the war in Ukraine and for trusting me to guide it. We're lucky to engage in a talk today with Ambassador John Taft. Please let me lead with the introduction. Ambassador John F. Taft is a retired US diplomat and a senior fellow at the Rand Corporation. He was a career foreign service officer for more than 45 years, completing his service as the United States ambassador to the Russian Federation from 2014 to 2017. He earlier served as the U.S. Ambassador to Lithuania from 2000 to 2003, Ambassador to Georgia from 2000 to, to, through 2005 to 2009, and Ambassador to Ukraine from 2009 to 2013. He worked from 2004 to 2005 as the Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for European and Eurasian Affairs, responsible for U.S. relations with Russia, Ukraine, Belarus, and Moldova. His other foreign service assignments include Jerusalem, Budapest, and Rome. Ambassador Teth holds a bachelor's degree from Marquette University in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and a master's degree from Georgetown University in Washington, D.C. Welcome, Ambassador. It's great to share this virtual space with you today. I, I, I'd like to start with a bit of a general question. Um, we are now on day nine since the Russian invasion of Ukraine began, and it's been um, heartbreaking to watch the extent of human tragedy, the devastation, the violence, but also hard to estimate what's, what's happening on the ground. The latest news this morning was uh, that Russian forces have seized Europe's biggest nuclear plant um, after heavy fighting in Zaporozhye in southern Ukraine. What are you hearing and what have you been seeing that other people might be missing? Well, thank you very much, Neil. I'm glad to be on the, uh, this web conference with you and I wanna thank the uh, Pittsburgh World Affairs Council for inviting me. Uh, I'm glad to be here today with uh, so many, uh, so many uh, people. You know, it's, I should start just by saying for me personally, this is a horrible tragedy. Uh, you know, I've been in touch with friends 
in Ukraine, and I, I know how much they are suffering. Uh, some of them I can't contact anymore. Um, and, and as someone who's worked in both countries and worked in Eastern Europe for most of my uh, adult life, uh, it just, it, as you see, you're heart sick to see what is happening here. Uh, these two peoples that, that always see themselves as brotherly and sisterly, you know, even Putin has said this over and over again, uh, are now fighting and killing each other. It's just uh, uh, the word that my friends in Ukraine, uh, the two words that they consistently use in their emails to me are unbelievable and surreal. Nobody ever dreamed that, that it would come to this point. Uh, you know, it's fundamentally, as President Biden and our other senior government officials have said, this is the decision of one man. He, Vladimir Putin controls Russia. And if we had any doubt of that, uh, you know, a week ago this last Monday, when we all watched uh, at least part of that Security Council session where he had his senior advisors get up and basically pledge allegiance to uh, uh, military uh, action in Ukraine, uh, you could just see he, he basically is, is, is controlling it all. And, and Vladimir Putin, we can talk some more about him personally but he's had a, a strong desire to take Ukraine back to what right what he considers the wrong of the end of the Soviet Union. Uh, you know, from the beginning, we saw this particularly uh, when he uh, when he during the Orange Revolution, during the Maidan in 2014, uh, and then of course uh, in recent years since uh, after they invaded uh, uh, Crimea and. Uh, uh, subverted, started the subversion of the Donbass. Uh, it's just, uh, it's hard to kind of understand that he has bought in to this uh, myth, I would say, that somehow Russia can recreate its empire. And the key to that empire, in his view, is taking control of Ukraine. And in, a, in, a, in the broadest sense here, what we have is a collision between this dream of Putin and the, the, the desire, the dreams of Ukrainians uh, to have a real independent national state. They got that back in 91 when the Soviet Union ended and they reclaimed their independence. And they have tried to build a, a state since then. And Putin has tried to, in this current round in particular, uh, has resorted, I think, after a lot of frustration uh, to using military force in the most brutal manner to try to force Ukrainians back in. Just one more word. Uh, early in this conflict, uh, it was actually the couple days before the, the actual fighting started, Arkady Ostrovsky, who is the Russia editor for The Economist magazine in London, uh, did a tweet. Uh, Arkady is an old friend of mine. I've known him for many years. He said, I just can't figure out how Putin thinks he is going to get the political changes that he wants because the people of Ukraine don't want to be under the Russian empire. And this includes, as we've seen in many of the press uh, interviews and tweets from people in Kharkiv and Mariupol, these places that are predominantly Russian speaking, these people wanna be part of an independent Ukraine. They don't wanna be a part of the Russian empire. And seen that over and over again. So the fundamental question here is, even as Russia has advanced with great brutality in, take, in killing and taking control of Ukrainian territory, the fundamental question remains, how does he hope to get this political control that is at the core of what he's been trying to do for the, I think, the last 20 years? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and to that end, uh, what do you make of the response of the West to the invasion of Ukraine, and you know, in Biden's State of the Union this week, we we heard the you know the forceful response and unity of the West in response to Putin's aggression. But um, I'm I'm still wondering how effective would that be, and what's your assessment of the sanctions and tactics of isolation the West has adopted against Russia? Do you think it's enough? I I think that the the Biden administration has done a pretty good job. They had couple of months to prepare for this. And as we've seen, uh, they kept open the prospects of negotiations. President Biden worked closely with uh, President Macron of France. And, and I'm glad that Macron is staying in touch with Putin. 
Uh, not much came of their phone call yesterday from everything we can see. Uh, Macron said that he expects the situation to get worse, but we need to keep that diplomatic uh, avenue open there. Uh, I think the administration has done a tremendous job to rally the alliance, uh, to uh, uh, protect the members of the alliance, and uh, to uh, these sanctions that have been imposed are, are, are draconian and are going to have a, a huge impact inside of, of Russia, uh, not just, unfortunately, on the oligarchs and the people at the top who, uh, who benefit from this, but I think from a lot of ordinary people are going to suffer as well. The one issue that's, or there's two issues really that are still out there in terms of suggestions that are made that the Biden administration could do more of. One is uh, to stop the Russian export of uh, energy, oil mm -hmm. in particular. And the Biden administration has held off from doing that because they know that the, the uh, with oil prices high, uh, with uh, other cuts that have gone on and the refusal of OPEC to increase the amount of, uh, of uh, energy that's on the world market, uh, that they wanted to keep that going. There's a lot of questions. There's an article this morning in the Washington Post by Fareed Zakaria, the CNN uh, correspondent, who says we really should take, we should take that down. The other one, and this is extremely painful, and that is every day, many times, I see emails, statements from President Zelensky to ordinary people in Ukraine saying the West should really uh, impose a no-fly zone over Ukraine and prevent Russian airplanes from bombing uh, uh, civilians and bombing military uh, units inside of Ukraine. President Biden has refused to do this because he understands, and I, I, I think it was expressed again yesterday and also this morning in Brussels by the NATO Secretary General, an, a no-fly zone basically would mean bringing American military aircraft, NATO military aircraft, European aircraft into conflict with Russian aircraft that control the skies over Ukraine. And that would then lead conceivably to a larger an even larger war with consequences that we can't see. The tragedy is of course, seeing the Russians controlling the skies and using that uh, uh, uncontrolled access to bomb and kill uh, not just military people in Ukraine, but uh, ordinary civilians. And it's, it's extremely painful. Uh, and uh, I think that Secretary General of NATO, Jens Stolenberg, said that again this morning. But uh, the NATO uh, summit meeting this morning, the virtual summit meeting, reaffirmed that that was, in fact, NATO policy. Mm -hmm. You know, let's um, let's switch gears a little bit and let's talk a little bit about the information war going on um, right now that is less visible, uh, but I think nevertheless powerful. Um, I, I'd like to share a story, uh, a personal story. Um, my aunt uh, lives in Donetsk, Donbass region, that Putin, before the invasion, declared part of an independent republic. For my aunt, uh, this war is the war of liberation. Um, she tells me they lived in a state of war for eight years and shares gory stories about atrocities, about the whole generation of kids being raised uh, in the state of war. Um, and you know, she talks about the leaflets she was she saw um, um, about you know uh, anti-Jewish uh, propaganda, and she um, does uh, say that you know my couch shakes every time there is another bombardment by these Nazis. Um, she calls Putin the man of peace. Uh, she tells me all they want is autonomy in the Russian language. Um, and then, you know, I hear that you now live in the States, and I know it's probably, um, she tells me, uncomfortable for you to hear this, but, uh, you know, I, uh, America is guilty for splitting us up, for, for making us fight our own brothers. Um, and uh, there is a lot of split within the family because her daughter lives in Kiev um, and her granddaughters live in Lviv, which is Western part of Ukraine. And she, when I ask her about their safety, she doesn't elaborate uh, because I hear from other family members that their relationships are strained because they're against Putin. And you know, on my, on my mother's television in Kazakhstan, 
she watches Russian news and Russian news tells her that there is no war at all. It's especially military operations. There are no civilian targets and they're there to denazify um, Ukraine. And, you know, I'm seeing it play out uh, very vividly in my own family. I'm also seeing how uh, talking to my nephew in Kazakhstan, he is has multiple sources of information and has a more skeptical view of what's happening. You know, I'm also seeing how the news is covered by the Western media um, and uh, what is debunked and how it's sort of spinning off, uh, um, being spun off in a way that also goes viral and then may not be really um, uh, well verified and fact-checked information because in the fog of war, uh, you can't tweet your way out of it. You know, things happen and it's very hard to do news, ga news gathering um, in the state of war. So I would love to hear your sense of, you know, this information uh, war that is happening and further uh, dividing and confusing the situation. And what's, what's your take on this? And I think it, it would be very helpful to hear uh, to some members of our audience who are high school students, like where do you go to get your news and get the latest and get a fuller picture of um, the war uh, in Ukraine and what's happening? Well, thank you, Mila. Uh, there's several questions involved in there. So let me try to uh, take them down one at a time. Uh, let me start and tell you a story back, which is that uh, when I was in Moscow, uh, as ambassador from 2014 to 2017. This, uh, I arrived in September of uh, 2014, about uh, six months after the Russian uh, invasion and annexation of Crimea. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, throughout my time in Moscow, I came to, I think, two fundamental conclusions. One is that uh, the Russian people were not being told the truth, uh, particularly on state television. It's uh, it, and the interesting thing that happened then, and it's only gotten even more prominent since, is that young people completely turned off. Uh, I remember early in my time, I, I asked one young uh, professional in Moscow, I said, so which of the TV channels do you watch? And he said, why would I want to watch any of them? Uh, he got his information from, uh, from the internet, and he got it not, not just from Western sources, he got it from a lot of Russian sources because there were a bunch then. Many of them have been driven out of Russia. Uh, there's a website that's now in Latvia called Medusa, which you probably see periodically. Uh, it, it's, uh, it has a lot of very good information. It's Russian journalists who have been driven out of Russia or have left because they were threatened. Uh, they have a lot of information and people <clears throat> uh, here in the States can access that. Just uh, if you go into Google, you can get it to translate it very easily into English, and they do a pretty good job of it. The other thing I learned when I was in Moscow back in the 2014 to 2017 period is that Russians in general, but the leadership in particular, didn't have a very good idea of what was really going on in Ukraine. And, and uh, I think we've seen that uh, illustrated in the failed strategy that uh, the military of Ukraine, of Russia, uh, started this war with. They, they thought somehow everybody was just going to welcome them to, uh, to, uh, uh, to Russia or to, to Ukraine, and they'd be able to take over Ukraine and drive out the government very quickly. Uh, that's obviously uh, was fa uh, faulty uh, logic. But you know, even when I was in Moscow, I came to the conclusion very quickly that uh, people just didn't get it. Um, I had been ambassador in Ukraine from 2009 to 2013. And in the spring and the summer of 2013, I traveled and made visits to Donetsk, to Luhansk. Uh, and I also took a trip, uh, the last trip really I took in Ukraine was down to Odessa and then drove to Mykolaiv and Kherson. These, uh, Kherson is a city that's now under the control of Russia. And, mm -hmm. You know, I talked to all kinds of people there, uh, you know, not just uh, calling on the governor and the mayor, but I talked to other people and my staff, my Ukrainian staff talked to people. So we came away with kind of a composite sense of things. And I'll tell you, none of those people wanted to be a part of Russia. None of them wanted to be under the control of Russia. They may 
agree with their government at the time. This was um, President Yanukovych was still in power. Um, and they had all kinds of grievances against him. But it wasn't an option. And I found the same in Donetsk and Lugansk. Uh, I read the other day in the New York Times, this was right before the war, that something like a half a million people had left Donetsk and Lugansk and moved to Kharkiv, uh, mm -hmm. a big city north of Donetsk and Lugansk. Now, those poor people having fled violence and, and uh, war in their uh, home region are now, of course, caught in this horrible Russian uh, attack on Kharkiv, which has got all kinds of uh, uh, weapons being used against civilian apartment buildings and the rest of it. But I came away from this whole period with this sense of just, they just didn't get it. They didn't understand how modern Ukraine had changed in the 30 years since the Soviet Union had fallen apart. And sadly, the assumptions that were built into this military campaign seem to confirm just that. Now, in terms of the, uh, the disinformation or the information that's put out there, uh, I try very hard, and I did, this is kind of a carryover from when I was a diplomat, to look at all sides. I, of course, read uh, American experts, both at uh, uh, journalists who are de uh, uh, deployed out there, but also uh, people in, in the think tank world here who I trust. I've tried to tap into Russian think tanks to make sure I understand. And I look at various uh, Russian websites, the Medusas, uh, who are opposed to the government, but also other Russian websites that report Russian news so that I have a, a good sense and a feel for what they're doing. And you know, I just have to say that the fundamental point that President Putin made, that this is somehow uh, the government of Ukraine, Zelensky is a, uh, is a Nazi and that he's, a, or drug addicts. I mean, this is just preposterous. Uh, Russia has throughout my life working on Russia or the Soviet Union before it, because I go back, this is going to date me, make me feel even older than I already am. But I was on the Soviet desk at the State Department in 1983. Uh, I arrived right before they shot down the Korean airliner that killed 270 people. Uh, there's always, they've always used the United States and NATO as a, as a foil. You know, we're to blame for everything. And I think actually that uh, many in the leadership, President Putin and others, actually do blame the United States for the end of the Soviet Union. They do not want to admit that this was a problem of, of their own system. Uh, and of course, this has become one of the, the, the worst parts of the propaganda that somehow uh, the United States uh, and NATO are responsible uh, for this whole thing. But I think it's pretty easy if you take a quick look to understand that uh, a lot of the uh, propaganda, and that's the only word I can use, is just unfounded. And uh, I, I give the Ukrainians a lot of credit. I think they have won the information war here uh, in turn, so far. Uh, you know, the Zelensky and the Ukrainian people for the resistance have captured the imagination of the world. And all you have to do is watch TV or look at newspapers or magazines, and you can see that. Uh, you can see not just in the United States, but in Europe, people are turning against Russia. Opera stars, uh, football teams, uh, conductors are being spurned and being having their contracts torn up because they refuse to speak out against Putin. Uh, I think it's pretty clear uh, that the, the propaganda uh, is, is wrong. But I understand, and you gave us a good example of uh, your relative in Donetsk, who, who watches this stuff and believes all of this stuff. Uh, the question I have, and this will be my last point, uh, probably too long an answer, I'm sorry, but uh, you hit a, a bunch of questions there. I, I think the, uh, the fundamental question is going to come home now when when all of these Russian soldiers, these young soldiers who are being killed in this conflict, uh, when people at, at the grassroots level, the street level, understand that these have come, are coming home dead, they ask themselves, what for? What is it? I mean, for years, for their whole lives, they were told that they were friendly peoples, Ukrainians and Russians. And so Putin manufactured this idea that somehow he was just... Uh, defending the, the Donetsk and Lugansk, when in fact it's a nationwide war 
that they have launched. There's going to be an accounting here at some point uh, of this, and maybe the Russian government has already started that. But ordinary people are going to say, why did my friend lose his life? He didn't know. His last message was, we're here on maneuvers and then he, in, in Belarus, and he finds himself inside of Ukraine and then getting killed. There's, this is going to take some time, but I think it's going to seep through into uh, the consciousness of ordinary people. At least that's, that's what I would suspect. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm seeing uh, quite a few questions about the extent of this aggression or potential extent. Um, and I would like to uh, invite readers to keep uh, questions uh, rolling. I will, um, we will attend to them um, in a few minutes. Uh, but I have a question that is about this. You know, you served as, an, as the US ambassador to Georgia and saw Putin's aggression firsthand in 2008. Um, I am curious, how do you read his ultimate objective in Ukraine? What is the likelihood that it will spill over into Moldova or goes into, as one um, question was, uh, you know, will it stay contained in the Ukraine or will there be a larger impact spread to disputed areas like you think about Transnistria, Abkhazia, South Ossetia and other um, areas. So I, I, I would be very curious to hear your sense because everybody in the post-Soviet um, sphere of influence, everybody's scared that, you know, like when, when will Putin stop? Oh, it's a good question, and I'm not sure there's a good answer for it at this point, because we're in the midst of this uh, horrible war. Uh, but you're right, my friends in Georgia are scared. Uh, my friends in, the, in the Lithuania and Moldova, they're scared, uh, and they should be. I think a lot of, the, a lot of this is going to be impacted by how the rest of the war goes. If you look at the maps in the newspapers, you can see that uh, apart from coming down to try to take Kiev, and they have not been successful, the Ukrainians have been, uh, the words of one military observer I read, just brilliant in the way they have uh, stopped the Russian onslaught coming down from the north. But they're, they're close to taking uh, Kharkiv. Uh, basically, they're using the same methods there that they used in Chechnya. Uh, they've surrounded most of the city and are just bombing and killing innocent civilians right and left from everything I've read in the newspaper. You can see that they're taking, uh, they've taken a lot of the coastline along the Black Sea in the south. Uh, Mariupol is apparently still holding, but it won't hold much longer, it appears, from what we can see. And then the, there's a battle at Mykolaiv, which controls the bridge over the Dnipro River, which will uh, is the way into Odessa, which of course is the third largest city of the in the country, and a lot of speculation as to whether they'll try to to do that as well. Um, so, I think at this point, I mean, the question, and I was on a web conference this morning with several American military experts who who know this area well. The question is, how successful are the Russian forces going to be? Uh, they still haven't secured but one uh, large uh, city in uh, Ukraine. They're still fighting and dying uh, on the road to trying to take the others. Are we going to end up here with just Russia controlling the eastern part? Will they even try to move west, uh, where you have even more uh, Ukrainian, uh, many more Ukrainian nationalists live out of Lviv in the western part than live in the east? But I think everybody in Ukraine has become pretty much a, a, a Ukrainian nationalist at this point. Will they be able to do that? Where where does the where does the uh, where does it get too hard for the Russians? Because of course the other thing, and we haven't talked about this yet, are the sanctions that are coming down. The Russian economy is very quickly coming mm -hmm. to a halt. And uh, you know when will you get to a point where you just can't? keep this going. The other problem is uh, that the military experts point out is that the Russians have clearly not done a good job with their logistics. You know, this, these big trains of uh, trucks and tanks that we see north of the, on the highway north of Kyiv, many of them can't move forward because they don't have gas. Plus they've got Russian soldiers who are deserting rather than continue to fight in this war and watch their friends get killed. Um, so there's a, what I'm trying to describe is a very fluid situation 
which where it makes it really hard to make a, a judgment about not only the the military campaign in Ukraine, but then if they even if they do succeed in in taking a lot of Ukraine, I think you'll still have guerrilla warfare in the east, and you'll certainly have fighting in the west. Are the Russians going to be ready to try to move into another country at this point? Uh, last point, I read this morning that the Russians are now bringing in more troops from their eastern uh, military district and their uh, the, the military district around Central Asia because they're losing casualties. They're losing people. And so this war, if this becomes a war of attrition, what are the, what's going to happen to the Russian army? Will, that, will they even be in a position to try to, to advance to another country um, knowing full well that if they go, for example, to Poland or the Baltic countries, then they will engage NATO uh, fully and we're sending even more troops there. So uh, I'm not sure it's a, it's, a, it's a done deal that uh, Russia is going to go into uh, these other countries at this point. We'll just, we'll just have to see how it goes. There's a, you can make the argument both ways. You know, in, in terms of uh, things that are fluid and uncertain and in a way unprecedented, you know, we heard the world to say never again uh, that there wouldn't be a world war, um, but uh, there is more and more, um, I guess, concern about how far it can escalate, uh, especially given that you know, the military and the weaponry itself has become much more sophisticated. And if in the past with the Cuban Missile Crisis, uh, you know, nuclear weapons, there were protest, uh, protests to uh, denuclearize, um, so to speak, the militaries. Now, you know, Putin is brandishing his uh, nuclear um, arsenal, and there is a huge question of what's the probability that he may deploy it. Um, and how can we, you know, there have been in different um, um, analyses that I've read, uh, sort of this assessment of Putin as an hinged um, uh, dictator, you know, he is capable of anything. I would be curious, based on your experience, um, uh, what do you make of these um, um, analyses and where do you put this probability? You know, I knew you were going to ask uh, me that question, Mila. So uh, I uh, was trying to think ahead. And uh, I have a good friend who's a psychiatrist. And uh, he's been uh, sending, uh, doing a couple of publications and uh, uh, saying that, uh, trying to get to the bottom of this, whether Putin has really become unhinged, he's crazy, you know, you, we've all read these things in the newspaper. And uh, he, he, he sent a note to me today, or he sent a, a column that he just published, and he said, um, trying to explain why Putin is doing what he's doing. And obviously, one question is he's very emotional about this, and we've seen this on his TV performances. Uh, Putin was always, at least in my time in Moscow and before, you know, he was willing to take risks, but they were always calculated risks. He was a calculated risk taker, and now he seems to have made these emotional decisions, which uh, haven't been based on really sound analysis or real understanding of the situation in Ukraine. But then the question of his own personal uh, ability. My friend wrote in here, I'm gonna just read you a, uh, a couple of sentences, which I think kind of address this issue. Uh, my friend says, Putin's age could have relevance here. Putin is 69 years old. Aging leaders, faced with competing pressures of ambition, their legacy, and their mortality, sometimes make rash decisions, bolstered by cognitive rigidity and a lack of integrative complexity. In Putin's case, his isolation, and this is isolation during because of COVID, and he's been very isolated, as we all know, his isolation compounded by Siloviki, these are the hardliners around him, uh, compounded by Siloviki groupthink could have played a role in the no, the intelligence failure to plan this properly. So I'm sorry if it sounds a little bit too uh, psychiatric, but I think there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of truth to that. And as someone who's 72 years old, you know, I try I fight against cognitive rigidity all of the time. Uh, you know, I can understand as a human being what he's trying to say uh, about that and. Uh, there, there may be something there. 
the bottom line is that none of us know on this or on many other questions where he's from. Uh, all I do know is that uh, he's very, he's been very emotional. He has a clearly a big chip on his shoulder. He's frustrated by his failure to get his way in Ukraine over the last 20 years. And he's, he's kind of gone all in on it this time. And uh, we've ta- I've mentioned the kinds of things that will inhibit his success. I think there's been a lot of failures already, but uh, they've doubled down now and they're uh, using really barbaric methods, uh, killing civilians, uh, you know, even attacking nuclear power plants to try to get control of the electricity grids. Uh, it's a pretty, I, it's part of the Russian playbook. We saw it in, in Syria, we saw it in Chechnya, and it, it's sadly being worked even on these, uh, what the Russians have always called the brotherly people. You know, it's, it's hard to understand, but it shows the, the emotion and the anger that Putin has on this issue. You know, uh, I this this will be the last question from me, and then I'm gonna move to the audience questions. Um, I would like to ask you about the humanitarian crisis that we see unfolding um, in the Ukraine as of March 1st. Um, according to the United Nations, over one million refugees have already fled Ukraine to neighboring countries. Um, in our currently being welcomed, it was predicted as, that this will be the largest uh, European refugee crisis this century. It is also important to note that along with the welcoming um, messages and, um, you know, the sort of the, the hope and um, the welcoming, um, the hopeful welcome, there has also there also have been reports of many students from African and Asian countries being discriminated against um, as they have been attempted to cross the border into countries accepting uh, Ukrainian refugees. Um, so how are these countries, smaller countries, um, as such as Romania, Slova- Slovakia, Moldova, expected to handle this flood of people? And, um, you know, what uh, what, what are some of the humanitarian efforts are being uh, made to ensure the safety of both refugees and citizens of um, these countries and the safety of, you know, black and brown refugees seeking to escape Ukraine? They're very good questions, and I think we've all watched on TV some of these just heartrending experiences of Ukrainian women and children arriving at the border in Poland or in Slovakia or Hungary uh, and being uh, permitted to come in after, you know, 10, 20 hours trying to get out of Kharkiv and get to the West to be able to protect their kids. Uh, we saw this one yesterday that just kind of broke your heart. These husband and wife from you from Denmark had literally driven from Denmark down to this Polish border town. And they had a sign saying, we can take eight people. And so they had each driven a car and they were gonna take four people each and drive them back to Denmark and basically take care of them. You know I mean? An amazing outpouring of, of, uh, of not just sympathy, but a willingness to try to, to do this. And the governments have done pretty well. Um, the state, the uh, uh, Congress is is being asked right now to uh, pass a large uh, bill, which would provide a lot more money for refugees. And I, I was pleased yesterday to see, I think it'll go through pretty quickly. Uh, I was pleased to see yesterday that the uh, that we've apparently are going to let Ukrainians stay in our country, at least temporarily, how this works out and gets adjusted. I think is 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 good, and the Europeans are going to do that as well. Uh, my wife and I watched one of these programs where it showed uh, young African students who had been in Ukraine being uh, turned back at the Polish border. And this particular uh, interview said, "Is this just pure racism?" And I obviously don't know the the situation, but you know these African students. It may not just it may not be racism. It may be. Uh, regulations, visa laws. Now, if these students are in Ukraine studying on a uh, in, and are on their passport from the African country that they live in, they may not be eligible the same way Ukrainians with Ukrainian passports would be to get in. 
Uh, my point is not to defend this. I'm not trying to do that, but there may be legal technical issues here. Uh, visa officers at the border or the uh, uh, immigration people have to comply with the law of the land. And there may be something like that. We have pretty uh, difficult laws on, on sometimes uh, you have to have special waivers to be able to get in. Maybe they'll, they'll do that. I don't know. It looks horrible when you see it on the television, but there may be some kind of an underlying legal justification that the newspaper reporters haven't mentioned. Um, and, you know, you would like to think that, that people, they would be let in, but, uh, uh, you know, that, that may be something that's up to the Polish and uh, Slovak and Hungarian and Romanian authorities. Yeah, you know, I have seen also reports that uh, that has happened at train stations where uh, they're not allowed to board trains, uh, whereas they may not be, you know, the, the for, for transport or somehow um, being pushed away. Um, so I think, it, to your point, there is a lot of complexity. I mean, I also remember when I was traveling with Kazakhstani passport through Slovakia, we got stopped at the border um, as well, just because we didn't have any visa. Let me go to um, uh, audience questions. There is a question about what the U.S. Um, organizations, U.S. aid organizations could do uh, to get a help to those in need in an effective way. And I think it would be, you know, it's relevant to our Pittsburgh audience who has been moved by this, uh, this crisis and would like to do something. Do you have any suggestions uh, for them? Well, I, I've talked to people uh, uh, at, at State, and uh, they, they have put out, and I, I don't have it here in front of me, so I can't uh, read the organizations now. Uh, in terms of taking care of people inside, still inside Ukraine, the, 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 e, the organization that I'm constantly being, or I've seen constantly uh, referenced is UNICEF. Uh, the UNICEF has uh, one of the best systems to take care, obviously, of children inside of, uh, uh, of Ukraine and refugee families. Uh, the UN High Commissioner for Refugees is dealing with uh, displaced persons inside of Ukraine, as well as those who have left to, um, uh, to, to get out of Ukraine to go to uh, Poland, Romania, or whatever. And then there's a whole group of organizations. The, I don't have a list now, but my daughter sent this to me, of organizations that you can uh, contribute to. It seems that the, the, some of the bigger organizations have the best uh, and most well-organized relief efforts. Um, perhaps uh, the uh, World Affairs Council people can access one of those and put it up on the website here of the different places that you can, uh, can, you, you can make contributions uh, to help uh, refugees and displaced persons. Um, there is a question about um, uh, about the uh, President Zelensky's decision of staying behind to fight the Russian Federation. Uh, do you agree with it? If yes, what should Zelensky do next? If no, then what should he, what should have he done? You know, I I'm not going to second guess this. I have no idea uh, exactly. I know there I've seen in the papers he's moving around inside of, uh, uh, of Kiev, uh, I, have, I don't have information, so there's no way of kind of telling him what he should do now or others. I think President Biden said it best the other day, that's his decision, he's gotta do it. According to the newspapers, we've urged him to try to, to move out, but uh, it's clear that one of the reasons Ukrainians are standing up is that their president is, uh, has taken such a strong stand and a courageous stand, and uh, you know, I. I saw yesterday one of the American journalists who met him at a secret location said, you're being compared to Churchill. And uh, Zelensky, with his usual humor, said, uh, or they said, are you an icon? And he said, he said, I'm not an icon. Ukraine is the icon. Uh, and, uh, you know, he had some kind of funny thing. I, I know on, on, on Churchill, he said, he said, I don't think I'm Churchill. He said, the one thing I do know, Churchill drank more than I do. Uh, but, but it was it was a classic Zelensky response to this, but clearly his uh, his staying there is it, it has been a source of inspiration for the people of Ukraine. He's extremely popular. Now, do they have plans if things if the Russians close on Kiev for him to get out of there? I would hope so. I'd hope mm -hmm. people who are figuring out how they're going to do this, because it would be 
it would be terrible if, if he were to die uh, because he's the, the symbol. Better to move to another location outside of Kiev if it really comes to that. That'd be my sense. Uh, he's too valuable uh, to lose at this point, but uh, I don't know what he's going to do. Mm -hmm. Could you explain why the U.S. European countries wouldn't have pre-announced an overwhelming number of sanctions that would be immediately triggered the minute Russian troops cross the border, as it seemed that this wait and see with escalating sanctions hasn't worked to deter the aggression? Yeah, I uh, I'm not in government, obviously, anymore, and uh, I don't uh, bother my friends who are working enormously hard at the State Department and the Pentagon to, to try to deal with this crisis. Uh, I try to stay as best informed as I can. I think there's probably two answers to your question. The first is they, they really did hope that this would somehow, the sanction, not putting sanctions in, holding them out like a sort of Damocles over the Russians head would deter Putin, and that obviously didn't work. But there may be another factor here that we don't know about, which is uh, President Biden and his team have tried extremely hard to stay in very close, uh, I won't say lockstep, but very closely coordinated with the Europeans. And it may be that the Europeans were not prepared to move ahead on some of these uh, kind of on preemptorily, preemptorily, preemptor, uh, preemptorial, I guess that's the word, uh, sanctions against uh, against Russia. Now, my own sense is that Putin had pretty much made up his mind to do this one way or the other. Uh, but And the one thing we do know is that having started the war, uh, the sanctions have been uh, heavy and fast and draconian, and there's more still coming. You know, there is a bit of a, a couple of follow-up questions about this uh, nuclear weapons threat. Um, and one is, you know, um, if Putin is indeed is indeed unhinged enough to launch nuclear warheads, are there enough level-headed people within Russia's military to stop that? And then there is, you know, there is another uh, the question within uh, in the same uh, realm. Um, what what strategies uh, could be uh, discussed to ensure that Putin won't have any desire to escalate it and put nuclear options into practice and thinking about third round of negotiations coming up, what would be the face uh, saving solutions out of this terrible war? Well, face saving solutions require one fundamental uh, factor that we don't have now, which is Putin's willingness to actually negotiate uh, based on the call that Macron had with him yesterday. He doesn't seem to be ready to do that. Uh, when I saw the statement he the statements he's made about uh, you know nuclear weapons, I took that to mean that he was using this as a kind of a warning to us and to the Europeans uh, as we impose more and more sanctions on Russia. You know, it was kind of like, don't forget, I still have these nuclear weapons. I didn't take it as a, I'm going to use these necessarily. Um, obviously, I don't know either, but that was kind of the, my kind of seat of the pants reaction to this. Uh, because he does know that the United States has the ability to, uh, to destroy Russia. Uh, they may be able to do it to us too. But I don't think Putin has an idea that somehow he can uh, he could uh, win and survive and achieve his objectives with nuclear war. I think he also has a substantial concern about his own safety about these things. And he knows that uh, uh, any kind of a nuclear exchange with Russia, that's it. Uh, so, you know, I, uh, I take it seriously, but I also, uh, I, I'm not losing sleep on that. I'm not losing sleep on that like I'm losing sleep worrying about my friends in the middle of Kiev. Mm -hmm. Do you think that it's we heard um, we heard about some people being uh, invite or, or volunteering to fight um, on the side of Ukrainian army? And there is a question: Do you think that it's a smart idea for NATO countries to allow their citizens to go and fight in Ukraine, even if they can't come back um, uh, radicalized? I don't know. I saw a, a report yesterday that said that something like 15,000 uh, people, non-Ukrainians, have shown up to fight. Uh, I don't think that the Western countries can prevent, uh, certainly the United States can't prevent somebody from going uh, to fight, at least as I understand the United States law. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't know for sure about the Europeans, 
uh, Zelensky has been encouraging people to come and fight, uh, especially people who have military experience, because they need all of the people they can to fight on all of these different fronts. Uh, I don't, uh, I don't think the administration will stop that any more than it's stopping the many private efforts to send uh, uh, material and uh, relief to Ukraine during the war. Mm -hmm. There is a question about the um, uh, the war crimes allegations. Um, this week, we saw we saw that, and there is a question: Do you think that Russia is guilty of committing these crimes, or rather, like what is the process to investigating uh, war crimes and actually finding um, a party in this case, Russia, guilty of those um, of those war crimes? I'm I'm not a, a a lawyer here, and I'll defer to people. I've seen different reports on uh, on television and on the internet that say that uh, the uh, targeting of civilians uh, is a war crime in a number of different places. I've personally watched uh, the, it was really cluster bombs that were dropped in Kharkiv in what was clearly a residential neighborhood. And then yesterday, you probably saw in Kharkiv, uh, they showed uh, four missiles coming down and just wiping out a whole apartment block. I mean, there was no military around that as far as anybody could see. I didn't see a military vehicle in the picture. So there's, I, from what you can tell as a, as a, as a non-lawyer type, there's no question that they have committed war, war crimes. And as we see in other, you know, this is, as I said before, it's as the same approach they took in Chechnya and they've took in, in Syria when they bombed uh, Aleppo and killed all kinds of civilian people. I think there will be uh, an accounting here. And I saw Tony Blinken, the Secretary of State, said yesterday, we're keeping track um, and we will uh, we will pursue this. Now, I saw that the UN Human Rights Commission, I think late yesterday, created a commission that was voted overwhelmingly to, in, uh, to investigate these war crimes. And I think there's other groups that are doing the same thing. So there will be an accounting for this. Uh, at some point, uh, I can't predict exactly how it'll turn out, but it would seem to me just from the observation I can make on television that uh, war crimes against civilians have taken place. Mm -hmm. And and you know the given that the the Hague uh, would be the international um, court would be involved in this case. And speaking of international organizations, there is a question if NATO and UN are not taking any action on this issue and seems to be and seem to be, you know, uh, rather ineffective in preventing this conflict. Um, why should taxpayers uh, support these organizations? Well, you know, I think most people know the. Well, put it this way: the UN Human Rights Commission is taking action to deal with the uh, question of war crimes. Mm -hmm. uh, the United Nations uh, has always had a problem dealing with conflicts in which uh, one of the uh, uh, one of the five permanent members is involved uh, because they have a veto. And as we've seen the Russians try over the last week, they have vetoed uh, resolutions. Um, and what happened was that the, when they vetoed the Security Council resolution uh, condemning Russia, they passed a resolution to uh, what's called Uniting for Peace to take it to the General Assembly. And two days ago, you had this overwhelming vote uh, condemning Russia in the General Assembly. There's no question that uh, Russia, even with some of its friends, uh, you know, China uh, abstained, uh, Cuba and others abstained, or I think Cuba voted with them. But they had like five votes in the entire General Assembly. Uh, they're 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 really a pariah in the inner in the world right now. But any as I said, anytime there's a secure a uh, uh, the involvement of a of a permanent member, and particularly Russia in this case, uh, you're not going to be able to get action by the United Nations because the Russians will veto it. And uh, that's one of the weaknesses of the UN. But the UN does a, a lot of other good in the world. And we don't always even read about it. It doesn't make it into our papers. The UN is still, in my view, a, a very worthwhile organization to support and uh, something that we should con continue to do. Um, there is a question that is about uh, Nova Gazeta in Moscow recently reported on the presence of Chechen soldiers among the Russian army headed toward Kiev. 
According to the newspaper's military analysts, the Chechens have special skills in clearing out resistance in cities, in, uh, on, uh, in street to street, building to building fighting, which they demonstrated during the Chechen war. Um, Nova Gazeta continues to describe this as a war in Ukraine and seems to be relatively independent in its reporting. What have you heard about this? Yeah, Novaya Gazeta is uh, one of the websites that I uh, I follow carefully. I used to also follow uh, Echo Moskvi, the radio station, which had a very good website, but that's been shut down now by the Russian government. Um, and, uh, you know, TV Dosh, uh, the TV Rain, uh, that's been taken off the air as well. But Novaya Gazeta continues, I think, probably in part because the editor, Mr. Muratov, uh, got the Nobel Prize, uh, and uh, you know it would be yet another uh, black mark on Russia if they were to take this off the air. They're careful on how they uh, do some of the reporting, and you know I think they even have a. I think they use the word war, but in Russia now you can. They just passed a law today that says if you uh, if you don't report if you report this as a war, you can get 15 years in prison. Uh, it's uh, it just passed the uh, Federation Council today. So you have to use this euphemism, you know, special military operation to describe what they're doing. Otherwise, you can get into deep trouble and be fined in Russia. Uh, I saw a web, uh, a meme the other day on the web that showed uh, the cover. Uh, somebody had adjusted the cover of the uh, of a Russian version of uh, Tolstoy's War and Peace. And instead of the word for uh, war in Russian, they had put special military operation in peace uh, on the cover just to make fun of uh, this idea that this is some kind of an operation in the Donbass when in fact it's a, a much bigger war that uh, that Russia and Russia alone has stimulated. I have um, more questions here, but I know that we have, um, we're running against time. We still have three minutes. Um, so I'm trying, to, I'm, I'll try to get through as many as I can. One is about the, um, a question, the question about Russian public. Uh, we hear many people talk about the withheld information from the Russian public soldiers are withheld information about the true reason for invading Ukraine. The citizens of Russia do not know the truth of what's going on and their children are being sent to fight a conflict they don't know about and the deaths of people. Those that do are being silenced by the police and government, especially in protest. Do you think that the people will rebel against Putin to the point of overthrowing him successfully or is he He's simply at a position to stay in power. I think that at this point, uh, the uh, the actions of the government, uh, the last I checked, there's like seven or 8,000 people have been jailed for protesting in different cities all across of Russia, uh, protesting against the war. And the, the regime has, the government has clamped down hard on these people. And I think we'll continue to do that because in the end, uh, this is an illegitimate war. And the people, as I've tried to say, I think the people of, you, of Russia will eventually come to realize that more. Um, they're working the propaganda on TV quite extensively. So I don't see, and I, I, I was on a web conference with some Russians the other day, and they don't see any kind of a challenge to the government at this particular point. But we'll see, depending on how, how long this goes on. Um, this will be my last question. You mentioned earlier about Putin's advancing age. Reports are indicating that Putin is really alone in this uh, without an inner circle of advisors or other influence. If he falls, do you think there is a clear leader that would rise in Russia and uh, would they like to continue with Putin's efforts? And also, you know, a lot of people who are in power right now are really Soviet uh, people who came of age in the Soviet Union and really um, have stayed along um, ruling the country that has been independent for a long time. So would really, um, that's, that's the last question. I, I would just say that uh, I think Putin has made sure there is no uh, heir apparent there. You know, if you remember two years ago, they changed the constitution to allow Putin to, to run again for president in 2024 and again another time in 2030. He could stay in power technically uh, until 2036. I'm not sure he's going to do that because later this year he's going to turn 70. 
but many of the guys who were uh, around him, Mr. Patrashev, the head of the Security Council, Mr. Bortnikov, the head of the Federal Security Service, the FSB, the successor to the KGB, these guys are in their 70s too. Uh, and uh, you, you know, even with the best medicine and the rest of it, time marches on. And uh, I think there's a lot of people within the Russian system among the elites who would love to be able to move up. The problem in the Russian system is as, as soon as you put your hand up or your head up, you're liable to get it chopped off because so you don't want to uh, get out there and be seen as any kind of a challenge. And so I haven't seen anything over the last week and a half that indicates that people are uh, of a senior level are standing up to try to do that. The opposition is on the street. The opposition is in professional circles, journalists, intellectuals, uh, and then the, the, the many thousands of people, ordinary folks on the, who've gone out on the street to, uh, to demonstrate against this war and to say it's just wrong. Well, thank you, Ambassador. It's a pleasure to share this space with you and Betty for closing remarks. Thank you, Ambassador Teft. Uh, thank you, Mila, Sanina. Thank you, everyone who has joined us today for caring about the world. There is much more to cover. I know we ran out of time. Many other questions were out there. Uh, much more to cover on this topic that we'll continue to uh, bring back to you through new programming, as well as other global issues. We'll be sharing information in the days ahead on how Pittsburghers can join together to support Ukraine. If you enjoyed today's program, please follow us on social media and visit our website, worldpittsburgh.org, to learn more about upcoming programs, including next week's Foreign Policy Forum with U.S. Uh, Senate candidates from PA. Programs like today are made possible thanks to our donors. Please consider becoming a monthly subscriber. Thank you, everyone. Wishing you all peace. See you next time.